Well, welcome everybody. I just do want to say real quick that it, um, that preschool is something that's on our heart as a church because uh, we want so much to be a church that doesn't just sit in these walls, but actually goes out into our community. And we just truly believe not only in, in just the power of Christian education, meaning that your children are learning about the Lord, um, not just one day a week, but like six days a week, five there and, and, and one here, but also just the incredible impact that a school can have because so many people will come in this area and they may not even be looking for a church, uh, but they need some a school. And so we want to create the best environment that we can to reach, reach them. So we'd love for your family, if you have kids of that age, to, to be a part of it. We'd love for you to share your friends um, about this. It's a great opportunity of an outreach for us to go out into um, the community and make a difference. And I've known Frank, the head of this, for, for many years. And uh, it was a former pastor, a friend of mine as well, and is a part of this church. And so it's been a, a privilege to be a part, partner with them and, and uh, to do something so special for our community. So thank you guys all for being a part of making that a reality. So hey, with that being said, um, I'd love to welcome our Boynton campus as always. And I would also love um, to welcome everyone at Church at Home. And I have been uh, just dreaming about, talking about, thinking about, reading about, praying about this series for a very, very long time. When God really just put in my heart this idea to help us begin to understand, to experience, to learn all about the power of God's grace in our lives. And so last week, we, we kind of kicked off this series with us trying to understand um, what is God's grace, that, that we wanted to define what grace truly is. And, and that grace is not forgiveness because forgiveness is not giving somebody something they deserve. But that grace it goes beyond forgiveness and that grace is not just giving somebody what they don't, what they deserve. It's actually giving them something they don't deserve. So, so, so forgiveness would be you stole $10 and I'm not going to call the cops. But grace is you stole $10 and do you need more? Here, let me give it to you. Right, so grace is something so much more beautiful and so much bigger than, 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 than what forgiveness actually is. And so um, even in the scriptures, Jesus goes, let me define for you what grace is. And when he does it, he doesn't just use a definition. He tells the story. And the story is the prodigal son. And, and it's the most powerful picture I think Jesus could paint of us understanding the grace of God. And he tells a story about this, this son who goes to the dad and goes, I wish you were dead. I want the inheritance. And he goes off into a foreign land and he does everything wrong. He wastes all of his money, does all the things. He brings shame to his father. He breaks his mama's heart. He loses everything that his dad gave him. He does nothing right. And in his brokenness, he comes running back home to his dad, realizing his dad could never forgive him. He'll never be his son, but maybe he can still be a slave or a servant. He can earn everything up, you know, back because he believed that maybe he could earn his way right. And yet Jesus says that the father looked at his son and he looked at him with compassion in his heart, not anger, not judgment. And he ran after the son and he hugged him and he put a ring on his finger and he put a robe on him to cover up all of the shame and guilt. And he threw a party and he killed the fatted calf and he used all of his wealth to help bless this child and throw a party because this son who was now disconnected because of their sin now has come home and is reconnected with his father. And Jesus goes, this is how your heavenly father treats you. Even when you do all these things, when you come back home to him. See, the prodigal son dad didn't forgive his son. He gave his son grace. And when you understand God's grace, it is so beautiful. It is so powerful, especially when you understand that of all the things in the world that God chose to be the foundation of your relationship with him, it was not works. It was not justice. It was not rules or laws. By the way, like every religion in the world, based upon how you perform and how you do things to get right with God. Instead, when it came to God, he says, it is by grace that you have been saved. And it's through faith. It is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And I, and I love this thing. And I love this picture because what God says in the middle of this is I'm going to choose that our foundation will not be a law that you obey. It will not be a religious routine that you practice. It won't be you getting your life right where your good outweighs the bad. What I'm going to base my relationship with you is this grace, this unconditional, undeserved, blessed favor that rests upon you. And I love the fact that God did that for you and me. In fact, I love the fact that, um, uh, that we learned last week that the reason he did this is because it was the only way. 
In other words, the only way that, that God could be in a relationship with sinful you and me was that he would use grace. Because if there's any other way, if it was justice, if we had to earn it, we would never tip the scales. We would never be good enough. We would never make it. And so God chose, I'm going to give up the rights for fairness. I'm going to give up my rights for justice. And instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose to make the foundation of our relationship to be grace and grace alone. And so we love that and we celebrate that. And I, and I pray to God that last week's message help you understand to receive that, to experience, because all too often in Christianity, Christians don't live this. They don't experience it. Like God offers it to you and God gives it to you. But in the reality, what happens is, is that we just don't know how, we're so used to judgment. We're so used to fairness and justice that it's so hard to receive. And so many Christians walk every day not enjoying the incredible grace that God has given you. And so hope last week helped that. But this week, what I'm going to do is we're going to switch up a little bit. And when we switch up a little bit, what I want to talk about is not just receiving grace, but I want to talk about what it looks like to actually give grace to other people. Now, um, grace is one of those things, isn't it, that is beautiful to get and brutal to give, <laughs> right? Like if you've ever got grace, it's amazing, right? When that police officer pulls you over and you were doing 90 to 45 and they say, hey, you were doing 90 to 45, but I'm just gonna give you a warning. What do you feel like? Yes, oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Like, that's great. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, I love you. I'm gonna donate to whatever cause you want me to do. I'm just happy, right? Because when you receive grace, it just feels amazing, doesn't it? Or I didn't make, you didn't make your numbers this month, but I'm still gonna give you the bonus, even though that you don't deserve it. Like, you know, it feels absolutely amazing. I, ha I had a friend one time and they were going through some struggles financially and out of the blue, they got a call from a guy who he used to work for. And he goes, hey, guess what? I haven't talked to you in like 10 years or so, but you know, um, we sold our company for lots of money. And I was just thinking back. And even though it wasn't in our contract, and even though you didn't have any stock options, I just remembered you were a part of this. So I'm gonna send you this check for like six figures just because I wanna bless you because of this. And this guy was blown away. Why? That's grace. Why? It wasn't contractual. It wasn't deserved. It wasn't required. It was just this chosen gift to give somebody what they hadn't really deserved. It wasn't owed them, but they did it in. And if you've ever received grace, it is absolutely beautiful and incredible. But listen to this, listen to this. As beautiful it is to give it, it is as unnatural to give it, is it not? Like, like, when, like, isn't there something in you that you love to receive grace, but would much rather prefer justice when people hurt you? <laughs> And, and, so, and so as you're going in there and, and your ex breaks up with you, um, how good does it feel when you found out they just got dumped after that? <laughs> You're like, yes, so good. Someone's, someone needs some help over there. We'll pray for them. Just stop the service, lay hands on them and pray for them. Okay. Yep, so good. But I agree. I agree. I agree. I'm totally, I'm with you on that. It does. It does. It feels good. And like, in the same way, like when you're, you're driving and you ever, you ever drive and, and you are driving fast, not like my father, you're going 85 on 95. But then there's that crazy person behind you, like honking the horn. You're doing 85 and they're like flashing lights and honking the horn and giving you the, the finger wave when they pass you by. How good does it feel in like three minutes when you look and the cops pulled that person over? It's, it, yes, yeah, someone else. There's a lot of bitterness in here we gotta deal with, right? And, and it's like, it's amazing, doesn't it? It just feels so unbelievable. Or you ever been benched by the coach and, and, and they put their favorite or their child in the team these loses four games in a row and you're like, yes, this is like, it just feels, it just feels good. Or you get, or your boss treats you really bad and the boss gets fired and you're like, see, there's something, there, there's something about justice when it comes to when you're the wronged that feels so beautiful. It's amazing. You love it. Like, God, you're so good. Thank you. I want more, right? But when it's you on the other end of it and you messed up, you love and you desire grace. So here's the question I want to deal with today. Why in the world? Why in the world? Listen to this. Why would I want to give grace to others that don't deserve it? Like, what would be the motivation to do it? Because today it's all about not just you receiving grace, it's you actually doing that. It's you giving. And remember, grace is not just forgiveness. We're not talking about forgiveness here alone. Grace is not just forgiveness, it's forgiveness and. It's forgiveness and blessing. Because what does Jesus call us to do? Hey, I want you to love your enemies. 
And I want you to pray for those that persecute you. Like I, I, actually, I actually want you to be like me towards other people. And just like I did that with you, I want you to give grace to other people. But here's my question, here's my challenge to you today. Why would you want to do that when it doesn't feel natural or good? Why would you want to give grace when it's brutal, when justice feels so right? Why, why would we want to give up our rights like God gave up his rights of fairness and justice? Like, why would we want to? What would be the motive of us giving grace? So today what I do want to do is I want to give you what is in my life the number one motivational thing that lets me and motivates me to give grace to people that don't deserve it. Now, um, it, it, is a, it is not necessarily what maybe should be my number one motive. I'm just telling you that. Next week, we'll talk about like the ways to actually do this and practical steps a little bit more. And, and in that, I'll probably say, well, this is, should be your reason. But let me tell you what my reason is. When I find myself in that circumstance and someone has injured me or let me down or done something and, and I, my, my, my heart is justice, what is it that motivates me to give them what they do not deserve, which is grace? And here is ultimately it. And we're going to explain this the rest of the day based upon the scripture. And this is what it is. I like to call it the law of grace and ungrace. And here's, here's the spiritual law you will see in the Bible. That the measure of grace or ungrace you give determines the measure of grace or ungrace you receive. This, this is the kicker. From both God and man. Now I'm going to, I'm not just, don't take my word for this. Because I'm going to show you some scriptures, because they're all throughout the scriptures, where what you will see is, and what God teaches you is, whatever grace or ungrace that you choose to demonstrate towards people who don't deserve it, will actually create the culture of ungrace or grace in which you live between God and other people. That there's something at stake far greater than your justice, far greater than them getting away with it when we make this decision. And the number one motivation that I have to give other people grace is actually the understanding that whatever I choose to give them will some way come back to me from God and from other people. That you have an incredible power that God's given you. And that power is to either live a life in a culture of grace from others and God, or you can actually live in a culture of ungrace, which is just justice and fairness from God and other people. And I'm going to show you. So let me read to you some scriptures where I want you to see how powerful, how often that Jesus teaches you and me the incredible power that you have to actually live in this culture of what is grace. Remember, it's not just forgiveness. What is grace? It's God's favor. That's why the Bible says God's grace or favor. And they use those words interchangeably in the Bible, by the way, in the Old Testament. And it says that God's grace or favor was on Moses. So he empowered him to do something. God's grace and favor was on Noah. And he let him build the ark and he saved his family. So when I talk about grace, we're not just talking about like forgiveness. We're talking about God's favor, God's blessing, God, God, God you know, all of these incredible things. So grace is this gift, God bestowing all of this favor, all of these blessings on your, your life. And so what I'm talking about when it comes to this, let me tell you the motive, because I want to walk in the favor and the grace of God and others. And the only way that I can do that, if I choose to give the grace of God out to others. This is exactly what Jesus says. And I want you to see how Jesus defines this. Look at this first. It's Luke chapter 6, th verse 37. And we'll look at these three things. It says, do not judge others and you will not be judged. Um, by the way, that word judge does not mean right or wrong. Um, because in the Bible, God's word does tell us what right or wrong is. Um, but that word judge actually in the Greek is the word krino. And here's what it means. It, we get our word critic from it. What Jesus is talking about is not making moral decisions based upon God's words. He's saying, hey, if you're critical to others, and if you're not critical to others, then other people will not be critical to you. See it? The same measure you use of criticism is the same measure that will be used on you. In the same way that, that you choose to be critical towards people, people will be critical to you. If you choose to give grace and not be critical towards people, then people will give grace and not be critical to you. See the principle, what, you are creating the culture of criticism by how you criticize. By the way, have you ever been in a relationship with a critical person? And if you've ever been in a relationship or you've been around someone that's critical, what do you find? That all around them, what is their conflict and criticism around them? Why? Because it's the spiritual law of grace and ungrace. And when you give grace, grace returns. And when you give ungrace, that ungrace returns. He continues, and, and you, you know, just do not condemn others or it will all come back against you. Now, what is condemnation? 
Condemnation is defining people by their worst moment or traits. Con that's why there's no condemnation in Christ. Meaning, yeah, you sin and you mess up, but you are not defined by that failure. Jesus covered that failure. You are a child of God. You are a saint, the Bible tells. So you are not defined by your failures. But what do we do as human beings? We define people by the worst seasons, don't we? That person's an adulterer. That person's a liar. What do you say? If you've ever been in a relationship, you've said things like, you always or you never. What is our natural thing? Is that we have a tendency to look at people in their worst season or their worst behaviors, and we define them by that behavior. And then that becomes how we define them. Now listen to this. But grace is, yeah, you messed up, but I'm not gonna define you by that one moment of season. I'm still going to see and say the good in you. I'm not gonna, the one thing that you did wrong or the couple things you struggle with, ignore all the good things. Now, what are you saying? He goes, because when you choose to give grace to others, you don't define them by their failures. Then what comes back to you is people then, and God does not define you by your failures. But when you choose to create the culture of ungrace and you rightly, if you will, you point out what they've done wrong and that's how you see people. And that's how people will see you. See, you create a culture of grace or ungrace. Listen to this, forgive others and you will be forgiven. Now remember I said, it's not just culture between each other. It's also a culture between you and in God. And what God is saying here is this whole things of grace, of, of, of judgment or being critical or condemning or, or even forgiving, that, that these things are not just a human thing. You do it to others, others do. It's also divine. Look at what Jesus says. Same thing. Luke 6, give and you receive and you're, oh, sorry, I missed that. There's supposed to be a verse there. No, sorry. Let me go back. I think I messed this up. Give me grace. Thank you for that grace. All right. <laughs> There's supposed to be a verse there. Um, and, and in that verse, it talks about Jesus says, if you don't forgive others, then your heavenly father won't forgive you. And so that verse, I think it's Matthew, I think it's Matthew six or seven. I forgot which verse that is in there, um, but it's, it's supposed to be there. And so w what that says in that moment is simply this. Hey, listen, this is not just physical, or not just between relationships, between people and God. In other words, Jesus says, in the same way you forgive others, I'm going to forgive you. And I think this is so important because when we talk about this culture of grace and ungrace, we are not simply talking about the culture of relationships with people. We're talking about between God and you and others and you. And he says, do not judge others, judge others. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. In the same measure, by the way, that you're doing this to other people, it's going to come back to you. And if you want to live in a culture of grace, you must give that culture of grace. And if you choose to give others, ungrace or fairness and justice to other people. It will come back to you. But notice how it comes back to you. Notice this next verse. It says, give. Now we're talking about being generosity. Remember, gener generous is what? That's part of grace. You're giving people beyond what they deserve. Give and you'll receive. But notice, notice what God says the return on how you give grace or ungrace is. Your gift will return to you in full. It'll be pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. And the idea is, have you ever seen like, um, you, ever, you ever have something you, you, you fill, you pour something in and, there's, and it gets to the top, you shake it up and you get rid of it in the air. And the idea is you just get more and more and more. It's poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount that you get back. What is Jesus saying here? When it comes to how you give grace or ungrace to other people, it does not return in the same measure it returns an exponential measure. That, that, that it's not that, oh, I'm going to give this amount of forgiveness and grace and mercy to other people and the exact comes back. He says, whatever you give back, give out, will actually come back exponentially. The best way to describe it is when you put a seed in the ground, do you get a seed back? No, you get a tree back. And you put something small in and then it grows and produces thousands of other seeds. And what Jesus is saying is the law of grace and ungrace. It's so important to understand this, that it's so powerful that as you begin to shower grace of God to other people, it doesn't just come back equally. It comes back exponentially into your lap. It's shaken down. It's poured over. It's pressed down. It's running over. This is the promise of the law of grace and ungrace that God has given us. And it's so powerful for us to understand how this works. By the way, when you add things like being forgiven and not judging and being generous and not condemning, what is the picture of that? It's grace. And what Jesus teaches you is that you have been given this unbelievable power from God that when you begin to plant the seeds of grace, what comes back to you are the trees of grace, something so much greater. And God's grace, which is not just forgiveness, by the way, it's His favor, it's His blessing, it's all, begins to 
overflow your life if you give it out to others. In the same way, if you want to demand a life of justice, if you want to be the one that points out everyone's faults and holds them accountable, in the same way that ungrace or justice will also pour out in exponential way when it comes to your life. This is what the Bible calls us this. It's the spiritual law of grace and ungrace. This is the way that works, that the measure of grace or ungrace you give determines the measure of grace or ungrace that you receive from both God and Man, this is the way that the world works. This is the way that God has said. This is what you call a spiritual law. Now, why do I use the word law? Do, do you know that, that there are, um, that, that, because laws govern reality. Laws supersede how you feel, what you believe or understand. For instance, we have laws in nature, don't we? Like, you, you, like there's the law of gravity. So the law of gravity is that I have this piece of wood in my pocket, right? And, and I know that when I drop this wood, what's going to happen? What's the law of gravity say? It's gonna drop to the ground. I could do this a million times. What's gonna happen every single time? It's gonna ground. Like, because it doesn't matter if you believe in the law of gravity. Nope. It doesn't matter if you understand the law of gravity. Nope. It doesn't matter if you agree with the law of gravity. No, it doesn't matter how you feel. That it, it supersedes everything. That's what natural laws do. And there are laws of thermodynamics. There's Newton's law, one, two, and three, about every, you know, action is equal action and every law in motion. Like, and you can look at all this. And what we understand in our world is that these laws do not change. They supersede our feelings, our emotion, our understanding, and our belief. These are what rule the universe. And so what we have to do is everything we build has to take into account the laws around because the, law of na the laws of nature govern all of us. And that's so important to understand. Why. That's what a law is. Because the laws of nature govern us, but guess who they don't govern? God. Because who created the laws of nature? God. That's why he has authority over them. You ever notice why God and through divine power is the only way you can ever supersede the laws of nature? That's why Jesus could walk on water and through faith Peter could walk on water and none of us can walk on water. Why? Because it's only through God's power because God's power supersedes, God's laws supersede the nature. This is why Jesus could skip the fermenting process and make wine in a moment. This is why Jesus could walk through walls. Um, th this, is, this is why Jesus can speak to nature and through his voice command the nature itself. Why? Because God created, the, the spiritual world created the natural laws. Therefore, it has authority over them. Why is that important? Why is this so important? Here's what I understand. It's because the law of grace and ungrace supersedes everything. That spiritual laws have authority over the natural realm. And this is why you see God being able to make promises all throughout the Bible. And I think this over and over and over again, that you see that when God makes a statement, it doesn't matter what anybody believes or anybody thinks or anyone tries to do to subvert it, that God's spiritual laws always have authority. Think of it. Isn't this what tithing really is? It's a spiritual law. And this isn't a message on tithing, but I want you to see the principle. God makes a promise to you and me. And he goes, hey, you take 10% of your company's profit, 10% of your giving, uh, of your income, you bring it into my storehouse, and then you what? Test me. And if you will do this, that's the spiritual law of obedience. I will then bless your barns, which is the physical, the business. I will, I will bless your family. I will bless your land. Jesus says, to actually draw your heart closer to the Lord, right? So, so what does he say? That when you obey the spiritual law, it supersedes all the natural laws. And that God who controls all things, when you obey this, and you get this area right in your life, what happens is that God begins to move in your business and your heart and your family and in your land. And everything changes the result of the spiritual law. Listen, I've never met a person, never met a person who has tied their whole life. I'm not talking about like I tried it for three months. I'm talking about they've actually done this over a long season. I've never met a person that they have not been completely blessed by the Lord. Why? It is a spiritual law that there's nothing that the world can do to break what God's promise is. It's the same thing with when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. It's the law of seeking God first. And what Jesus said, if you do this, then all the other things you're searching for, your clothing, your work, your provision will be taken care you don't have to be anxious. You don't have to worry because the spiritual law of putting God first supersedes everything else the enemy can do and the world can throw at you and God will take care of you. So what we understand is that God works in laws. He creates promises and principles that when we follow it, it doesn't matter if we believe it. It doesn't matter if no one else believes it. It doesn't matter what anyone tries to break it. Nothing can break a spiritual law. This is what 
is the same as true with the spiritual law of grace and ungrace. And what God is saying to you is simply this, that when you in your life choose to give grace to other people, it doesn't mean every person, but in general in your life, the grace of God and the grace of others will flow in your life. And when you choose to live in a justice-based relationship, eye for an eye, what's fair is owed me, and you choose to do that, then what will take place in your life is that ungrace will flow back into your life from both God and others. This is an unbreakable law and reality that comes from God. And it's so important to understand this because there's so much power in this. And listen to this. And we have seen this all throughout our life, have we not? Like, I, I, think, I think you realize this more than you realize, because this is true in, in business. Have, have you ever been in a, in a business where, where your boss cared for you? Some of you are like, no. <laughs> But it's amazing, because I have. Like, have you ever been in a business where the person that, that you work for actually values you and cares for you? And it's amazing, because what you discover is those employees really start to care for the company. They care for the boss. They work hard. The longevity increases, and all of these things begin to take place when it comes to this. Why? Because it's the law of grace and ungrace. In the same way, have you ever been, and most of you will say yes to this, you ever been in a relationship with a company that, that treats you transactionally? I mean, they don't care? They don't know. They, it, you're just a number to them. And, and you've seen those people and they, they, they work there 10 years and they, they get laid off and there's a, the security walks up to them. You have 10 minutes to get out of here and they escort you out of the building. How do the people treat them? They treat their company, therefore, like a transaction. Why? Because it's the culture and the law of grace and ungrace. And when ungrace is given to you, ungrace is returned. My, my, um, my youngest son and I, He's really into sports now. And he, he's, he's been watching all of these like documentaries. And one of them we started watching was The Last Dance, which is crazy. I've never seen The Last Dance with Michael Jordan and the Bulls from that huge meteoric run. And what was amazing to me is I was thinking about this. We were watching the story of Scottie Pippen, Michael Jordan's right-hand man. And if you know anything about what took place during this meteoric rise, the Scottie Pippen was like, like the second best player, they said, in the, in the whole National Basketball Association. But before everything got great, he signed a long-term deal with the Bulls. And he did it because his father was paralyzed and his brother was paralyzed. And he needed to figure out a way how to take care of this family. So he signed this deal. Well, he signed the deal before the Bulls won all the championships and all the things. And all of a sudden, what happened? You remember, if you guys don't know anything about sports history, the Bulls, like, just stormed the world. And they won like six titles in eight year. And, and Scottie Pippen was like the right hand to Michael, all of these things, second or third best player in the NBA. And he was paid the same as the 122nd player in the NBA. And, and, and he was furious. Why? He's like, come on, I signed this contract, but look, I've made you billions of dollars. Now look at what's happened. I've done all, you're reaping all the rewards. Won't you renegotiate this contract? And the owner and the manager were like, we will not do it. You're stuck. You're going to get exactly what you deserve. Nothing else and nothing more. I'm not going to redo it. You know what happened? They showed him ungrace. And then they were talking about it because what took place, um, one, one end of a season, he hurt his ankle and he did surgery. And Scottie Pippen goes, you know what? I chose to not get the surgery over the summer so I'd be ready for the season. Why would I mess up my summer? Instead, I'm gonna wait till the first day of training camp. I'm gonna schedule the surgery then. I'm gonna miss season. Why? Because I don't care. Why? Because I was showing on grace which created a cycle of ungrace, and therefore I returned ungrace. And, and what, what was the principle Jesus just said? It's the same measure you give out is the same measure that comes to you. And you see in this, this picture, the last dance, this total dysfunction of every single person grabbing from themselves and holding everybody in this way. And this ungrace eventually broke apart the greatest team in the history of basketball. Why? It's a spiritual law. And when you, just like, listen, I'm just telling you this way it works from God and others. When you give ungrace, you give, but when you give grace, grace returns. You know, the same is true with our relationships. I would have you raise your hand, but it probably wouldn't be wise. <laughs> How many of you ever been, don't raise your hand, please. Um, I've been in a relationship with someone where that other person struggled giving grace. Don't raise your hand because I already know the story. Right? And, and, and if you're ever in that relationship with someone that doesn't give grace, meaning they point out all your faults and they, they don't really notice all the good, but they focus on all the bad. What is your natural response to someone who constantly criticizes you? What do you do? I'll tell you what you do because I've done it. You search out, listen to this, what do you do? You search out ammunition to defend yourself, don't you? Because you understand, man, if I mess up and that happens, they're gonna come at me, so I gotta be prepared. Now, what are you searching for? Here's two things you search for. You search for the good things in your life, 
I'm going to remind them all the things I do well. And here's the most beautiful part. I'm going to search for all the bad things they did. And I'm going to create the list. So when they come at me and point out that one thing, I'm going to have seven things they did wrong to bring it back to them. Come on, anybody ever done that besides me? Don't make me feel bad. You can raise your hand now. Wow. I might need more help than most of you guys do. Because I'm really good at that, right? Like, I'm actually pretty good. I can point out all of the... I can, I have, I've actually... It's embarrassing to me. I've actually written lists. I've done it. You ever those notes on your phone? And I'm t- keeping track, dates, things. Okay, you didn't do this, you do this. Why? I'm ready to go. Because when that person points out what I've done wrong, they're going to regret it. Because I'm going to bring it all out on them. I'm going to show them. And what am I showing them? It, it's natural. As a human defense mechanism, what am I trying to show them? I'm trying to show them that I'm better than them. And it's not maybe from an arrogant standpoint, but it's from a defensive standpoint. Because when I feel attacked, our natural response is to defend ourselves and to attack back. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. Why? Because we make amazing judges. We do. Like, tell me something. If, if, I, if your spouse were to come to you, and I'm using that, and say, hey, can you list 10 things that I could grow in and get better at? You know what you say? Can I get 20? <laughs> per page? And you know them. And just write, you could write them out right now. But if I were to say to you, what are the 20 things you could change in your life? You go, I, you know, maybe one or two. <laughs> right? Because it's just natural. And here's what I want you to see and understand. It's so important. But when two imperfect people, listen to this. When two imperfect people begin to hold each other to this justice-based relationship versus grace, what happens is a cycle of ungrace begins to just tear apart everything in that relationship because it's the spiritual law of grace and ungrace. And the more grace you give someone, the more the grace comes back. But the more ungrace you give, the more ungrace comes back. Isn't this a picture of what Jesus tells with the famous story of the plank and the dust? You guys ever read this story? It's, 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 it's beautiful. Um, because here's what Jesus says, and I want, you to see, I want you to see the image of this, right? Here's what Jesus says. Um, uh, I think I missed something up again. There we go. Thank you. This is it. Thank you. They corrected me because I was wrong. Here we go. Um, so Jesus says, once again, do not judge or you too will be judged. So see this principle, right? Um, For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. What is he? See, this isn't just like one time. What is Jesus ultimately saying? The measure of grace or ungrace you give out creates the culture of grace or ungrace you live in. It, it's the same thing over and over and over again. It matters when you're in that moment and you're angry and you want to get revenge or get things that fair. Understand the spiritual law of grace and ungrace. Whatever you're giving out is actually going to come back to you. And then he tells the story that's funny to illustrate it. And he says this. So he goes, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? What are we? We're great judges. And pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, although we would all love to do that, right? When all the time there is a plank in your own eye, for you are a hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, be self-aware of your own issues, not so aware of other people's issues, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And when you are self-aware and remove your own issues, it actually enables them to deal with their issues. Okay, this is a lot of wisdom in this, but here's what I want you to focus on. As Jesus tells the story, it's kind of comical, right? And he's doing it on purpose. He's revealing to us the natural state of human nature. And he goes, here's what people are actually like. He goes, imagine for a moment, that's too big. Let me get a little speck, okay? Imagine for a moment, here's my issues and here's someone else's issues, a little speck, okay? And here's what he says. He goes, what happens is, is when people, what's natural happens, want justice. And we look at the speck, we are so focused on that person's speck, that's all we see. But in this story and illustration, what do you notice about what both parties, both the speck and the plank person, are focused on? Each other's issues. Because the person, the plank, doesn't see their plank. All they see is this person's speck. And as all they see is the perspective, they're trying to get this person's speck to change. But in the person, the speck, who are they looking at? They don't see their own speck. Why? Because they're so busy looking at the plank. And so what do you have in a relationship? You've got two people in a relationship that both clearly see the other person's fault and neither of them can see their own issue. Now, here's what I want you to see. Where does that lead in a relationship? 
See, the culture of ungrace breeds a culture of ungrace. And as I remain there in that moment looking at that speck, and I keep looking at that speck, and I point out that speck, all along the person with the speck is looking at you going, come on, like, who are you? Here's the list of seven things you've done wrong, and you have the nerves. I mean, what's happening? No one is dealing with their own issue. And instead, what's happening, they're going on the attack, they're going on the defensive, and they're focusing on the other person's issue. Well, as long as both people are focused on the other person, issues and not on their own issues. Is there any way for peace? Is there any way to reconcile? Is there any way to change? And the answer is no. Instead, what do you have? You have this giant circle, cyclical sections of ungrace going back and forth and back and forth. Do you know how many, whether it's marriage counseling or friendship counseling, I've done in my life and exactly what you see. And you see two parties and you see two parties sitting there and all they talk about is, well, they didn't do this and they didn't do that and they never do this and they always say that. Well, no, but you always did this and the reason I don't do that is because you didn't do this. And you have two people sitting there. What do they do? Doing exactly what Jesus talked about, creating a culture of ungrace. And this is why they're sitting in counseling and this is why there's so much dysfunction and anger and lack of love and I don't feel like this anymore. I don't understand why we're in this. Why? Because both people are focused on the other issue. And both people are living the culture. And what Jesus said, they're dealing with the law of ungrace and grace. And it says, whatever measure you give out, it's gonna come back to you. It's exactly what's happening. But see, the problem of the measure of the law of grace and ungrace, it doesn't come back equally, remember? It comes back exponentially. So what happens in relationships, and I've seen this all the time, as she begins to neglect his needs because her needs are neglected, he begins to become resentful because she's not doing what she's supposed to do in his mind. And so he begins to justify how he treats her because he, she's got these real wounds. He's got real wounds. Here's what you have. I can create the list. These are real offensive. I have been injured by you because of this. And because I'm injured, now I actually feel justified to injure you. And I also feel justified to hold on to my own issues. But what takes place is as, as I am feeling injured and therefore justified to injure you because of your behavior and you deserve it and it's only fair, I start to implement more things in your life, meaning I'm now doing more and more things wrong. So now what do you have? You have an X, now your list is from seven to 14. And now that your list is 14 because of the things you've done wrong, well, now you feel more justified to not do the things that he or she needs and to start doing it. And you're gonna say things publicly and you're gonna humiliate them because nothing else works. And now they're sitting there going, my list was at 14, now my list is at 21. And because my list is at 21, now I'm gonna go ahead and expedite this to 28. You see the principle? And what takes place is what started out as a speck turns into a plank. And what started out as a plank turns into a tree. And next thing you know, you have this forest of dysfunction that happens. Why? Because the law of grace and ungrace is unbreakable. And as long as you want to live a life where you give people what they deserve because both of you are imperfect, then you will have two people that will stand there fully justified, praying, Lord, I've done everything and they've done nothing. And the other person will be like, I've done everything and they've done nothing. But the reality is that both of them have simply lived the law and experienced the law of grace and ungrace. I think a beautiful picture of how this is painted was written by this author. And here's what he says. Vengeance, which vengeance is what? It's simply returning to someone what they deserve. Vengeance is a passion to get even. It's a hot desire to give back as much pain as someone gave you. We're just talking about fairness, right? Not talking more, just, just enough. The problem with revenge is that it never gets what it wants. It never evens the score. Fairness never comes. Why? Because you keep exponentially increasing. And the more you are injured, the more you injure. And then the more you've been injured, the more you injure. And the more you injure, the more you're injured. It just, see, it's exponential. It's not the same. And then he says this. For the chain reaction set off by every act of vengeance always takes its unhindered course. It ties both, to, uh, both the injured and the injurer to an escalator of pain. Both are stuck on the escalator as long as parity or evenness is demanded. And the escalator never stops and never lets anyone off. This is the law of grace and ungrace. This is, this is what Jesus says. Let me, let me just tell you something. Why do I give grace to other people? Because I need it. And because I know that what Jesus taught us it's just like the law of gravity, just like the law of, th just, there's not breakable. And th that when I'm in this situation, as long as I'm going to demand justice, I will live in ungrace and the ungrace will come back to me from others and from God. And only when I choose, listen to this, and only when I choose 
to break the cycle of ungrace by giving grace, will eventually I step off that escalator and allow unity and healing to take place. There is no other way because of the law of grace and ungrace. Unless someone in that relationship is willing to go, you know what? You don't deserve it, but I'm gonna still do it. Instead of retaliating with evil, I'm gonna retaliate with good. I'm gonna love my enemy. I'm gonna pray for those that person. I'm gonna be like God was to me, to you. I was reading this um, book on grace, powerful book. And in this um, book by Philip Yancey, what's so amazing about grace, it told about this incredible thing that happened in 1991 between the USSR, Russia, and Christians. And some of you might not know some of the history there, but under Stalin, um, Stalin and the KGB murdered and executed over 42,000 priests. 42,000 people slain because of their faith. And yet when the USR fell and all these bad things happened and Gorbachev's now the president, they started to realize, wait a minute, like we've got to fix things. And part of what we need to do is we need to somehow reconnect with the Christian community. Morality had just completely lost and we, we need them, their help to restore our nation. And so Gorbachev opened up a dialogue between Christians that were, um, many of them slaughtered, um, by the relatives slaughtered, tortured, put in the gulags, the prisons, beaten, tortured. And so they said, we're gonna set this meeting up and we're gonna invite all these people that we did all these horrible things to. And we're gonna invite them into this meeting to try to reconcile this relationship. But, but mostly for selfishness, right? They just, they just wanted, they needed the Christians. And so what was interesting is the, the general, which is kind of interesting, his name is General uh, Storov. Um, he, he began this meeting of all these Christians that, that had literally been, that had to leave their motherland and go through all these things and people executing their family and all this torture. And he says to them this, he says, it's, it's a plot twist that could not have been conceived by the wildest fiction writer. He said, for we here in the USR realize that too often we've been negligent in accepting those of the Christian faith. But political questions cannot be decided until there's a sincere repentance, a return of faith by the people. This is the cross I must bear. In the study of scientific civic atheism, there was an idea that religion divides people. Now we see the opposite, that love for God can only unite. So this is the KGB, the vice chairman, the person that's responsible for killing 40 something thousand of these Christians, torturing and imprisoning much of the families of people that were sitting in this room. And you know what happened? The people in the room started to do, <clears throat> well, they started to get back at him. They started to say, yeah, you, you say that. None of them believed him, by the way, because they said it was stoic as possible. Like it was, it was just like you'd see in a movie, Philip Yancey says, all oh, the KGB was cold, unemotional, unimpacted, reading a script, and they all thought it was all manufactured. And so one by one, the, these Christians stood up, but what about you did this? And what about the priest that did this? And what are you saying? And they started to bring up all of the things that the KGB had done, and they were all true. All true. What was happening? Ungrace was in the room and we respond from tension and tension back and forth and back and forth. And in 1991, the translator, the translator whose own family had been suffered, stood up and he does something so powerful and I just wanted to read it. The translator's name was Alex and Alex stood up in this meeting and he says, General, many members of my family suffered because of this organization. I myself had to leave the land that I loved. My uncle was very dear to me, went to a labor camp in Siberia and never returned. General, you say that you repent. Christ taught us how to respond on behalf of my family and on behalf of my uncle who died in the gulag. I forgive you. And the translator stood up and he gave this vice chairman of the KGB a bear hug and hugged him. He said, all of a sudden, Philip Yancey looked up and he saw a tear run down the KJB's face. The one that was cold and unemotional, the one that was reading through the emotions, the one that was fighting back when people were confronting him. And he whispered in the ear, which he later shared with the rest of the group, what the KG man said. He said, only two times in my life I've ever cried. It was the night my mom died and the other one is tonight. Someone broke the cycle of ungrace. Someone was willing to go, yeah, I, I'm owed that debt and you don't deserve it, but I'm actually going to give it. And the tension in the room and the tension in the relationship shifted. And this hardened man who was insolent and I think really unrepentant, broke down in tears and became repentant. 
there is a power that comes with grace to shift the culture of ungrace. And it's the only way. Maybe that's what Nelson Mandela taught the world. Maybe that's what Martin Luther Jr. King taught the world. Abraham Lincoln, who said, why would I continue to seek revenge in my enemy when I can make them their friends? And ultimately, isn't that what Jesus did for us? Like ultimately, wasn't that what, what God did? Because when you look at history, it's amazing because what you see is the same pattern. Is God gives us these laws that were good. Like don't murder, don't steal, honor your father and mother, be faithful to your wife. Remember this Sabbath and keep it holy. I'm gonna give you this way to thrive. But what do we do? We get it wrong. We sin. We don't live up to the measure that God has called us to live. And then what takes place? After that sin, justice comes in. And then we get angry at God. And God just, gives justice towards us. And then there's separation in relationship. And then you could follow it for hundreds of years, the nation of Israel. And it's the same pattern. They come back, okay, God, we messed up again. All right, we're gonna come back. We're gonna get it right this time. And they do for a season. And then they don't follow through on the laws and they get things wrong. And then justice prevails in that relationship. And then separation happens. And they come back again. God, we messed up again. All right. And God gives them another chance and he forgives them. And then he gives them the laws. And once again, they fail. And then they get justice. And then they get separation from God. And so finally God goes, enough. I'm gonna get off the escalator. I'm gonna give up my rights of what you owe me. I'm no longer gonna bring up all of the sins of your past. It's no longer gonna be able to find you. Instead, I'm gonna give grace. And what did Jesus bring in? From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Because see, God understood that grace was the only way to break the chain in the culture of ungrace. And the same is true for you. And as I find myself in these moments and I find myself in those moments where I feel justified because someone has wronged me and every fiber in my being desires justice, I'm always reminded of the law of grace and ungrace. And I go, you know what, God? I kind of need your grace. I don't just need your forgiveness. I need your grace. I mean, there's so many times in my life, God, you've given me what I don't deserve. I look at my life around and I pinch myself. God, you have, your grace is all over my life. And there's no revenge towards anyone, what they've done to me, that is worth me giving up your grace. Because the law of grace and ungrace is unbreakable. And you have to make the decision. And I want you to understand something. You have the power you and only you have the power to create a culture of grace or ungrace in your life. And every time you find yourself in that marriage or in that relationship with your boss or your employee or your friend or your coach or your roommate or your uncle or your nephew or whatever it might be, and there you are injured, there they've done something they shouldn't do, your choice of how you respond to grace or ungrace is not just about what you do to them, it will actually unleash in your life a culture of grace or ungrace. And it won't just give you the exact return, it's exponential. And I say to you, what is the motive for me to do it? It's this, I cannot live in ungrace towards you and expect grace from God and others. In the same way, I cannot give grace to others and, ex and not expect grace from others in God. And I pray that the law of grace and ungrace begin to motivate you and me to give grace to people. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace, for your modeling this. Thank you so much just for all that you're doing in this. And Lord, I just, I just pray. I know there's so many people that have been injured, that feel justified, but somewhere along, I just pray that we step off that escalator and we choose to break that cycle. Give us the power to give the same grace to others as you have given us. And may that unleash in our lives the culture of grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. Man, what an incredible message uh, from Pastor Scott. And man, um, we would love to hear what spoke to you. I know for me, it's such a challenging message. I, I think uh, what, what he was sharing about how we define ungrace is defining someone by their worst traits. Man, that really spoke to me. I'm like, hey, I'm checking through my life and, and examining my life. Hey, who have I potentially not given that grace because of the grace that I've 
been given. And so I w- we want to hear from you. We want to hear what was it in that message that truly spoke to you, that challenged you, and that you're going to say, hey, this week, I am choosing to live by this way. And so go ahead, drop that. Let's start a conversation in the chat. Drop in there. We want to hear what is it that spoke to you and really what God is doing through you this week uh, through that message. And uh, maybe that message did speak to you and you wanting to share it to someone else. God popped it on your heart saying, hey, maybe you need to share this message with someone else. Go ahead and just share that message to whoever that person is and uh, maybe they'll be blessed by this message too. But church, we love you and so thank you so much for tuning in. We pray that you're going to have an incredible week and we do this together every week. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. In Jesus' name, church, we love you. Have a good week. God bless.